Mike Russell. So Mike Russell just showed up out of nowhere as this black conservative and former cop. Uh, political folks were calling around trying to figure out like, who's this guy? <laughs> What's his story? And he has an interesting one, as you'll hear in this interview. Mike has never run for public office. He hasn't even been in Atlanta for long, but there are a lot of unknowns about him. The big question for Mike, Atlanta is a democratic city. So are voters gonna elect a fairly new resident who happens to be a black conservative to a job that has always been held by folks with deep ties in the Atlanta community? Mike, it's great to see you on the show. How's it going? Thank you for having me. It's going good. Very busy. Yeah? Yes. All right. Well, we're going to talk about a lot today. Okay. Um, I'm excited to talk. This is the first time I've actually ever talked to you. Right. We didn't even talk on the phone to set this up. Uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this and want folks to get a sense of who you are, why you're running for office, like what motivates you, uh, where you want Atlanta to go, stuff like that. Right? Okay. But before we do that, we have to do a segment called How Atlanta Are You? I know you're fairly new to the city, right? When did right. you move here? Three years ago. Three years ago. Okay, then you had a pandemic, so you haven't quite explored the city as much as you would, but l let's just roll with the question <laughs> okay. and see what happens, all right? All right, so what's your go-to spot to hang out in the city? Piedmont Park, um, when the weather's nice. And uh, I like Summer Hill. I think... I'm a little bit upset with my real estate agent that she didn't show us that when we were looking for a house. But uh, Summer Hill and Piedmont Park are probably the places that we go to most often because they're within, uh, Piedmont Park is within walking distance and we try to walk most places. Are you in Ansley? Yes. Okay, got it. Not in Ansley Park, Ansley Apartments. We don't, have one of those, <laughs> we don't have one of those big houses in Ansley oh, Park. Okay, okay, all right. Um, you talk, you know, in the pre-show, you were mentioning how well-traveled you are. Uh, Atlanta calls itself an international city, although sometimes I don't think we really are. Uh, but when you want to feel like you're somewhere else, right, like you're in Europe or another part of the world, where do you go? Hmm. Um, the works is nice. It kind of reminds me of Europe because it's walkable. Where is that? That's um, on the west side, um, not far from um, Bold Monk Brewery. They're right next to each other. I've been there a couple times. Um, there's a French restaurant right down from our apartment called um, Atmosphere. We were there two nights ago. They have a really good French food. And we have a lot of friends here who are expats, so we hang out or you know, cook and that kind of thing. Got it. Um, outside of your neighborhood in Piedmont Park, you mentioned that, which is in Midtown. What's your uh, favorite neighborhood in the city? <clears throat> now you're going to get me in trouble. I'll mention neighborhood and people will say, what? Not my neighborhood. Um, again, Summer Hill. I like the little small shops there. Uh, we spend a lot of time in uh, West Side Provisions. Um, we like to go up and down the Beltline. Since we adopted our dog, we haven't been able to use the scooters as much. So we haven't been able to do that. Um, trying to, we, we don't like to go to the same place too often, so we kind of like travel all over the place. I like Grant Park. Um, I can't name all the restaurants we've been to since we've been in the city. Um, had a really good time in Inman Park at the Trolley Barn. I really highly recommend the uh, Atlanta Secrets concert series. It's a quartet. We saw um, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach to the Beatles, and that was a good connection for me because I'd been to Leipzig where he wrote a lot of his music he was from. So that was a really great event. Um, yeah, just all over. I do go to Midtown, but not as much because it's a little bit too busy for me. Got it. All right, well, we will let the public judge just how Atlanta <laughs> you are, Mike okay. Russell. Um, now let's just talk a bit about like, who are you? Give me just a little bit of, about your background and upbringing. Where were you born? What was your family dynamic like? Yeah, well, I was born in Oklahoma, uh, near Fort Sill, where my dad was in the army. Uh, my grandmother came from Texas in a covered wagon. 
my, my maternal grandmother. And I grew up in an all black segregated neighborhood on Carver Street, 554 Carver Street. On one side was a Native American uh, reservation that was known as the uh, Fort Sill Indian School. And on the other side were two sets of railroad tracks. And uh, everybody in that neighborhood was working class people. I mean, today they'd probably say we were poor. We didn't know we were poor. And uh, it was, it's a very fond memory, even though it was segregated. Um, the houses were small, modest, but they were all clean, well kept. Uh, I talked to my middle brother when I was writing my uh, bio for my website, because sometimes you may remember things differently than everybody else. So I was talking to my brother about it, and I said, so, you know, what did you think about my bio? And actually, if you look at my website, the two of us in cowboy hats, that's my middle brother, Tommy. He said, no, man, it was just like you said. <clears throat> and so we started talking, and, he, and I said, yeah, you know, a few years ago, I went back with my son, Nathan, and we pulled up in front of my grandmother's house, and I started, I just burst out in tears because the neighborhood had just been ravaged. And he said, you know what? I had the same experience because he moved back there. And he said, I took my wife, his wife is British, and uh, wanted to take her where I grew up. And he said, I pulled up in front of Nana, my grandmother's house. We called her Nana. And he said, I just burst out in tears. And then my wife was like, what's wrong with you? Are you having some kind of you know, war flashback or something? He's like, no, I can't believe what they've done to this house. And that neighborhood now just looks like a war zone. It's, it's just been devastated. And it's, it hurts me even now. Uh, my dad, you know, it was not his mother, it was his mother-in-law. He wanted to buy the house and move it because that house meant so much to our family. It was our anchor that when my dad went to Vietnam, we stayed with my grandmother. When anybody was in trouble, you know, they went to my grandmother. That was a place of refuge. And to see the people who live there now that have have no value for it. And, you know, most of the people living there now, they're not owners, they're renters or they're section eight. And they've just destroyed what was once a very proud and prosperous black neighborhood. And when did you leave Oklahoma? I left when I was in the uh, eighth grade. And went where? Went to Germany. My, well, my parents had bought a new house in a uh, neighborhood just up the road from where my grandmother's house was. And I, we'd been living there for about, I guess, two years. And my dad got sent to Europe on a training mission and came back and said, we're leaving, we're going to Europe. And the whole family thought he was nuts. And my dad, um, to his credit, his thing was, we can always buy another house, but our kids need to see another part of the world. And as I say in my bio, that really changed my life, to be exposed to things that I ever, you know, didn't know existed, and also to see things that I only had read about and seen in a movie and to live in a different culture was really a phenomenal thing, and it really changed my life. It changed my perspective even on myself. And you went from a segregated town to a multicultural international city. Yeah, the town wasn't um, – when, when that subdivision was built, it was segregated by law. And when um, – in the 70s or, or early 70s, there was no official segregation anymore. Um, I was in the second or third grade when they started busing, so that was a, a big deal. Um, I went initially to the same school my mother went to, Douglas, after Frederick Douglass, and it was the pride of the neighborhood. You know, we had the church, the doctor's office, the record shop, the community center, um, and it, it was just a wonderful place to grow up. And so what was that transition like to go from a place where there was this kind of rich family culture uh, to completely new territory? At first, my brothers and I, we didn't like it. We said we were never going outside to play. But uh, then you realize that all the other military kids are in the same boat you are. They came from someplace. They're not with their family. So you make friends pretty easily. And we adjusted. And um, I have one brother that's still in Europe. <clears throat> Got it. Uh, so your father was in the military. You joined the military. It sounds like one of your brothers also joined the military. You joined in the Army, right? So right. share a little bit about your Army career, uh, why you joined, and what you uh, what you benefited from that. Uh, it was something I just always wanted to do. So my ambition was to graduate high school and become an Airborne Ranger. And my dad was like, no way. 
um, you need to become an officer. I went through that as an enlisted man, and he saw that officers had it made, which is not really true, just a different type of pressure. So he was insistent that I go to college. And uh, all of my siblings, but I was the only one that finished. The rest of them, for whatever reason, they dropped out. And so when I went to the recruiter's office, I was still in high school. And it was the first time I ever remember defying my dad. And I, he wanted to go in and read the contract and all that. And I said, if you do that, I'm signing up today. So he stayed in the car, and I signed up to join the reserves. I went to basic training, came back. I was in the North Carolina National Guard infantry unit. Uh, all the way through college. And then uh, I got my commission in my uh, at the end of my sophomore year and became a lieutenant in the infantry in the North Carolina National Guard. <clears throat> and that was the first time I ever met a Klansman. And uh, um, that was interesting. And then uh, one, upon what, graduation... What was that? <laughs> Hold on. Don't just skip over that. What was that like? So I, it was in Whiteville, North Carolina, uh, the county seat. And uh, I, they had known me as an enlisted guy in the unit. And then I show up one day and I've got lieutenant bars on, which is a very difficult transition. And so um, we would show up, the leaders would show up on Friday night and plan for the weekend. And one of those Friday nights, I came in and uh, some of the sergeants who were going to have to work for me, uh, one of them was Staff Sergeant Smith. And he said, hey, what's your first name? And I said, well, you don't need to know that because you won't be using it. I'm your lieutenant. So he said some very choice words that I can't repeat on the air and said, I'm not calling you lieutenant or sir. And so uh, I went to the first sergeant the next day. And the first sergeant, who, you know, was from South Carolina, had a deep southern drawl. And I was like, oh, man, how is this going to work? <clears throat> and this taught me a lesson about judging people by their where they're from. And he said, lieutenant, what do you want to do? And I said, well, if he can't call me sir, he can't work for me. And he he put him out of the guard, right? No questions asked. And so a couple of meetings later, this guy comes up to me and he's telling me about how great the Klan is. And I was like blown away. I was like, seriously? He goes, oh, yeah, I'm in the Klan. And um, I was the only black officer in that unit. Matter of fact, uh, Lieutenant Washington, who was the, the company XO before me, um, left there um, very distraught. And he said, man, good luck. And we tagged out. He left, and I, I came in. And um, my platoon sergeant told me, I've never worked for a black man. I've never called a black man, sir. And he was not in the Klan. And he said, but you know what? I'm going to give it a try. And at the end of my two years, when I got ready to leave, he came and shook my hand and said, it's been a pleasure. I enjoyed working for you. So, it, you know, as hard as it may sound to have to work with somebody who's an open clansman, um, they never did anything to me. I don't know what they said behind my back, and I really don't care. It was just that I was the lieutenant, and I was going to establish that, and I did that the whole time I was there. I did feel some um, <clears throat> discrimination uh, from my company commander. But the first sergeant really took my side, as did a lot of the NCOs. I mean, these guys were tobacco farmers and stuff. The people you would think that would be the most racist were the ones who came to my aid, and I'll never forget that. Interesting. Um, I, I'm going to ask you this and tell me if this feels a little too indelicate. Um, you are openly gay. You're, yes. You're married. What was that like? I know you were married at the time, um, but how did that feel to you, kind of given what was going on in the military? And I think, I don't know what year was Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, that came with uh, President Clinton. Bush or Clinton. Clinton. So um, I, would been, I had been struggling as a lot of uh, gay men of my generation with coming to grips with my very conservative Christian background, which I am still a practicing Christian, and being gay. And I tried to suppress it. I literally tried to pray the gay away. And it didn't work. And so finally I came to the realization, uh, first admitting it to myself that I was gay, and then to my wife. Um, and that was very difficult. I can we, imagine. Yeah. And uh, we had two small children. And so I was willing to stay in a uh, platonic relationship with her for the children's sake. And I still to this day feel very guilty that I was not brave enough to come out even to myself. And to be honest with you, because I had never had any real 
uh, education and sexuality. I really didn't know what those feelings meant that I was feeling. You know, I just knew, hey, you're not supposed to like other men because you're going to die and go to hell. And once I educated myself and um, realized that I could not suppress this, you know, it was like a volcano. It had, I had, it had to be released. So I came out to her. Um, the first person after that I came out to was my priest because I converted from uh, being a Baptist to a Catholic. And, uh, That's a significant conversion. It is. And part of that was because, you know, we had mixed-race children. We'd go to one church, it'd all be all black. We'd go to another church, it's all white. You go to Catholic churches, everybody. And um, I felt very at ease there. My wife was raised a Catholic, but she was not practicing. And so I went through the classes to conversion. And in the process of going to Mass, there were a couple things that happened that gave me confidence in Father Jay. One was his insistence on welcoming everybody. And there was a moment where um, in the Catholic Church, you know, once a month you take up a special collection. So he took up a special collection for the, at that time, the AIDS house downtown in Anniston, Alabama, because AIDS was an epidemic at that point in the uh, late 90s. And nobody gave anything or very little. So the next Sunday, he stood up and he said, um, he was totally off script, I thought, for a Catholic priest. He said, hey, listen, I've been the parish priest here for X number of years, and this is the first time I've ever been ashamed of this church. I asked you last week to give money for the AIDS house, and you folks didn't give anything. And um, you're treating these people like lepers. And so I'm going to give you another chance to redeem yourself. And so everybody dug deep and gave. So I was like, wow. And this, And I was going through my struggle at that time. And then a um, few weeks later, somebody burned the AIDS house down. <clears throat> so he got back up in front of the congregation after Mass, and he said, hey, um, if you probably heard that somebody torched the AIDS house and it burned completely to the ground. And we're going to raise money, and we're also going to have a, a candlelight vigil, and we're going to march from City Hall to the AIDS house. And I'm going to be in front. And I hope that I'm going to see some of the members of this parish there. And when he did that, that convinced me that he was an open-minded, fair-minded person. And that's why I was uh, confident to go to him when I came out. Got it. So what has been that uh, dynamic internally of, of uh, what the church has always taught, uh, right, historically versus, you know, your current, your relationship with God? What has that dynamic been like? reconciling the two well i won't call any names but i have issues with some of my family members who still don't accept me as being gay i'm not a welcome in their house with my husband so i don't go there um and that's very common for a lot of gay lgbtq people of my generation i'm not alone in that um the what i learned living in europe is that the american catholic church is way more um tolerant, I'll put it that way, than the European version of the church. And we're sort of like the rebel child of the Catholic church. And so, um, that tracks with history. Right. So back, uh, earlier days, I used to travel from Germany to DC to the Pentagon a lot for work. And I started going to mass there because the Jesuits who are even the liberal of the liberal Catholics, uh, held mass there was very welcoming. And uh, what I found since I've been in Atlanta, I go to the uh, Shrine of the Immaculate Conception downtown on MLK. It's a very welcoming parish. One of the priests is openly gay, uh, Father Henry. That's not Our Lady of Lords. No, that's no, a different one. That's a different one. This okay. one's is, is right is right on the corner of MLK, uh, right down a block or two down from the state capitol. Oh yes, okay. All right. And that's so a huge church. Right? Yeah. It's Pretty big, yeah. pretty big church. Yeah. The claim is we have people from 45 uh, zip codes that go to mass there. It's very welcoming. Um, have a, a phenomenal outreach to LGBTQ, to homeless people, to everybody. So I feel very at home there. And um, I know that there's some conflict with the mother church in Rome, but I don't feel that with I'm with my, as uh, the priest likes to call them, my siblings in church. Got it. Great. Uh, we'll transition a little bit uh, and talk about um, why you're running for council, 
Mike Russell is not a, a household name in kind of Atlanta politics, right? No. Um, so you moved to Atlanta three years ago, and you're now in your first mayoral election, your first council election, and you said to yourself, you know what? I think I'm going to run. <laughs> no, that's right? not how it happened. <laughs> okay, how did it happen? So uh, when all the riots and everything were happening downtown, um, well, let me back up a little bit. So the way we picked Atlanta, uh, since my husband was Dutch, I we uh, made a deal about uh, where we would live. Uh, it had to be some place that was in one uh, flight for his parents. And unfortunately, where were you living previously? Uh, we were living with his parents in the Netherlands because I had gotten rid of my apartment. He sold his, and we had moved in with his parents waiting for his visa. So we came back to the states, and um, we had traveled through the states before, but we came back to the states to look for a new city. And our last night here on that trip, I asked him to write down on two lists, one, the best place for vacation, and one, the best place to live. And I did the same. And so we exchanged lists. And fortunately for me, um, <clears throat> Atlanta was the top of our list for best place to live. <clears throat> what was the second city? Charlotte, North Carolina, <clears throat> on both lists, hmm. amazingly. And so um, I have been to Atlanta many times. I live across the border in Alabama. I've been coming to this city since 1984. And I really love Atlanta. Um, and I'm not just, I, I mean, we moved here deliberately. Uh, we didn't have jobs here or anything. We moved here because we wanted to be in this city. And when everything started to fall apart last year, it was very troubling to me. And the thing that troubled me the most was the violence. So I was upset. I was yelling at the TV. You mean when you say everything fell apart last year, you're talking about the protests, George Floyd. Help me understand what you're talking about. The violence, the the protests, the, the, not, the, not so much the protests. I mean, I was in the Army to protect people's right to free speech. I don't have a problem with that. It was the vandalism and the violence. And I was like, you know, this is Atlanta. This is the cradle of the nonviolent civil rights movement. I mean, we're the city of Martin Luther King and, and – uh, Julian Bond, uh, Ambassador Young. How is this happening in Atlanta? And I, it well, really it's happening all over the country, right? But not in Atlanta, right? The city too busy to hate. That those words mean something to me, and I was really both shocked and upset. And he told me, "Look, they can't hear you yelling on the television. If you, if it really upsets you that bad, you need to go do something." So I started to go out and volunteer. And I, um, <clears throat> I tried to work with the schools, but they were just too bureaucratic. And I started uh, taking food to cops because I had been a cop. And I started going around uh, the city, and I was, um, I joined a group, a committee we called ourselves, um, helping the hurting and the homeless. And I started expressing my views on, on social media, particularly next door <clears throat> and Facebook. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, like, no, I sensed good. it. You're I was good. like, good. let me get him some water. Thank you. So, um, I, uh, hold on. <clears throat> I might have to take another sip here in a minute. Yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so, um, People start saying, wow, you have some good ideas. You don't have the, you know, lock everybody up mentality about policing. Um, you know, your ideas about homelessness and intergenerational wealth, they all make sense. Why don't you run for office? And I was like, no, I'm not a politician. We have people in office. They need to fix this. And after a while, that kind of snowballed. And a couple of guys, uh, two, one ex-cop, one current cop, uh, a couple of lawyers, just some plain old people sat me down and, you know, I think they ambushed me. I think they had it planned out and said, you need to run and we'll back you. And long story short, after they talked to my husband and he agreed to do it, I said, okay, I'll do it. They actually wanted me to run for mayor and I said, that's a bridge too far. So we made a compromise and I said I would run for uh, city council president. Why council president? Because it's, it's not the mayor. And I knew that I wouldn't be able to raise them. But you them. can't introduce legislation. No, but you have a voice. And you, you have a purview over the whole city. Not you know, It's not siloed into different communities. And that's what I was worried about, that I would only be in one community. I want to affect the whole city. You get to, come, you get to uh, set the agenda. You have a voice. 
and the city council controls the budget. And I think that is one of the areas that they failed in the past is they have not stood up as an equal branch of government to the mayor. And that doesn't have to be a confrontational uh, relationship, but they do need to stand up and do their part and, 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 stand up to the mayor when when they think that the mayor is not doing the right thing. And I don't think the city council has done that enough in the past. Are there some examples that you can give where you felt the council did not stand up to the mayor? Um, when the those police officers were fired, whether justly or unjustly, you know, that's for a court to decide. And I think the mayor fired them without due process. And everybody deserves due process. Whether you're a cop or not a cop, everybody deserves due process, and that didn't happen. And the city council remained silent. Um, but what could they have actually done? Well, they could have protested, and they could have they could have at least told the mayor that we disagree with you. Uh, they could have sent a very clear signal to the police department that we stand with you, that all cops aren't bad. And that's that was the first strike while our cops started walking off the job. And then when the city council, the blue flu, right? Is what that's called. And when the and when the city council seven members voted to defund the police, that was strike two. And so um, we've got a serious problem in our city right now with crime, and part of that goes but back to hasn't that. Hasn't the council also given more money to the to Atlanta Police Department than in now, previous elections or uh, in previous cycles? This year, but we went a whole year, right? And talking to cops. You know, it's like being in the Army. I've never met a cop that was in it for the money. They do it because they, they have a sense of purpose and a sense of service. Every cop I've talked to, majority of our cops are black. They all love this city. That's the first thing they tell me. I love this city. I either grew up here or whatever. I love this city. I don't want to leave. But sometimes I don't feel like I have a choice. And firemen are the same way. Um, so I also think that the city council has, was negligent in the way it spent money. I watched as they voted to spend gobs of money without reading the bills. I mean, I just couldn't understand. How can you do that? I watched them. They passed the budget, right? And an hour later, and I'll just call his name out because it's public record. Andre Dickens stands up and says, I have a bill for one point, I think it was $1.4 million for security cameras. And as they are all scrambling over themselves, getting to Felicia Moore, the city council president, to get their names on that bill as co-signers, the clerk says, oh, wait a minute, that's the wrong bill. Oh, yeah, we don't have 1.4. We only have 500K for cameras. Did anybody stop and slow down and say, hey, you know, maybe we ought to read this first? No. They all scrambled to get their names on as co-signers to spend the 500K, right? So they can go out and campaign and say, you know, uh, I voted against the police last year, but I voted for security cameras this year. And then... Antonio Brown stands up and says, oh, but wait a minute. I have a bill for 250 k for cameras. Oh, can I get my name on that? Nobody's read it. Then a third person, it was a, it was a lady, I don't know, I don't remember the name. Oh, I have 75 k for cameras for uh, illegal dumping. There's no difference in those cameras. Nobody read those bills, and they spent over three quarters of a million dollars. And nobody can say, are those cameras going to work? What kind of cameras are they? Are they going to be integrated into the video integration system? Do they have audio? Are they going to be like those cameras that failed when Katie got killed in Piedmont Park? They didn't care. They just did it so they could get their name and say, I voted for security cameras. And that, to me, was infuriating. It was absolutely the wrong way. I spent millions of taxpayers' dollars in the military. And if I had done it like that, I would have lost my job. And they need to lose theirs. So if you were council president and that happened, what would you do? I would have put a stop to it, or I would have, have handed the gavel over and reminded my colleagues, this is the wrong way to do business. And I would never appoint anybody to be the finance uh, chair that ran their committee like that. If you ever watched how that committee was run, where they voted on things where they didn't even discuss how much it cost, like co renewing contracts, city council president, I would have stood up and I would have put a stop to that. Uh, and or I would have brought the press in or if I couldn't talk to them offline and convince them to do it otherwise, then then it's time to go to the public. I think the first step is you go to them face to face and say, hey, this is not right. We need to stop this. And if they don't listen, then it's time to bring the public in and let the public put pressure on them to say, you can't spend my money like that. Hmm. So as a council <clears throat> president, you can decide who chairs committees 
um, which you talked about. Uh, what other things do you feel that you have the power to do as a council president? I think you need to be a voice for the people. And I think the council president also needs to be a team builder between the mayor, the council itself, the sheriff, the DA, the schools, uh, to bring people together. And that's something else I did in the Army as a negotiator. And I think the city council president is in a position to do that and needs to do it uh, more robustly in the future to bring people together to solve the, brick, the, the major problems that this city faces. You know, right now it's crime. It's also infrastructure. It's our schools, which are not the direct responsibility of the city uh, government, but those kids belong to all of us. And our schools are failing. Our schools are going to have one point, I think it's 1.2 or $1.4 billion this year. Uh, I just read. And Plus I the East Blast. Say again? Plus the East Blast. Right. So only 30% of our kids can read at the appropriate level. Math and science are even worse. And the pandemic has made it even, even worse. worse, right? So uh, Atlanta Public City Schools, I was told, I haven't verified this, that this year it's 19 and some change per student. And they're failing. You can go to Christ the King for 10 and have outstanding education. You can go to Crystal Ray, which I'm going to tomorrow to have mass with the students. Um, those students there have to be at or below poverty. The average family of four income is $31,000 a year. This year, they're going to have um, 100% of their kids are going to graduate. Everybody can read and write. 100% of their kids are going to uh, have, you know, in previous years have qualified for at least one university. This is the first year that they're going to have students at, eligible to graduate from university, and they're expecting a 97% graduation rate. These are kids that are so coming. So what are they doing right that APS is not doing? That's a good question. Um, I've seen some of it firsthand. Um, some of it is, is because the parents in that school have skin in the game and they empower the parents and the students. So to go to Crystal Ray, you have to pay some tuition. Um, the one, the lowest that a family pays is $66 a year. The average is 250, right? The rest come from donations and from tax credits and various things. But what I saw in that school was discipline, holding people accountable, and the parents have to be part of the equation. And I think part of the problem with public schools, not just in Atlanta, but across America, when I compared them to Europe, is that we have taken authority away from the family. So a lot of parents have gotten this misconception that you can drop a kid off at eight and pick them up at 18 and everything's fine. That's not how it works with education. I say this on my website. Educating a child, that's a parent's responsibility, and it goes beyond schooling. You know, that's everything. Schools, books, libraries, computers, those are tools society give, our society gives to parents to help them in that job to raise their kids, to educate their kids. And when you so take— how do you get the parent who hasn't <clears throat> been as hands-on, right, today, how do you get them to be hands-on tomorrow that and, is, and, in the, and going forward? That's a very good question, and, and there's no easy one answer. So there's a couple things. I'm working with a guy uh, by the name of Myron uh, Fontaine. He, he goes by the title of the prison doctor. And our plan Sounds is— Sounds a little scary. No. He was in prison for 20 years for armed robbery. Uh, he's from Detroit. He realized he admits his mistake, and what he's doing is trying to help not only the youth but the parents not fall into that trap. So he has a program where he actually goes into the home and deals with all the issues that are leading kids astray. But how do you scale that, right? APS has thousands of students. Right. So it will take some time. And that's why he and I are working together to, for funding and to scale it up, right? And that's just one program. It's a very successful program. I, I would um, recommend to your viewers to look up the, the prison doctor. Um, and, and you may want to have him on the show. A very passionate guy, very successful at doing this. That's just an example of what could be done to help these kids move in the right direction. Uh, you have programs like um, the Drake House, which takes homeless moms with children with a wraparound service for up to two years and gets them to be self-sufficient, and that should be the goal of every program. Um, I think that the kids in our schools and the parents need more choice of where they go to school, 
there's different ways of learning that um, last night I was on a Zoom call with a, with a lot of uh, moms and a couple of people who worked down at the juvenile justice with the prison doctor talking about their sons, mostly their sons that they had lost to gang violence, street violence, or who were incarcerated right now. And we were talking about what we can do together to turn this around because the government's not going to do it. And what I want to do as city council president is I want to, I want to stop investing in these shiny things like the Olympics and Mercedes Stadium and the Beltline. And I want to invest money in people, in individuals. So if we can reinforce a program like the prison doctor so that he can reach out, I don't care if it's five or 500 kids that he saves, I'm willing to invest in that. If we can invest and duplicate what they do at the Drake House here in Atlanta, I'm willing to do that. If we can get the At Promise Center duplicated five times and they're bringing these kids off the street and giving them hope and direction, I'm willing to do that. We don't need another grandiose program. We need to start investing in individual people. I want to put money into folks so that if the mom needs education, she needs job skills, she needs parenting skills, we pay her to go to school and learn that. It almost sounds like you were supposed to run for council for a school board instead of council president. No, because again, school is only one aspect of it. This is this is everything, right? Yeah, but historically, <clears throat> AP historically, there's been a clear line of demarcation between the council and mayor on one line, and then APS on another. I'm not saying that's right, but that's how it's been historically. And that's a problem, because when I went to school in that segregated neighborhood. Our school was a part of the community. And my parents knew the principal. They knew the teachers. Um, and we don't have that today. And so we've got to break down these barriers between the school and the rest of the city and the rest of the community because these kids and their future is all of our responsibility. And that's my approach. I'm, not, I'm, I'm very frustrated with these silos of this is mine and that's yours. These kids belong to all of us, and that includes the police, that includes the juvenile justice system, that includes the schools, that includes the industry that's in this city, that they, a lot of them have stepped up, they need to do more. We need to put, when people talk about holistic, they talk about government programs, I'm talking about the entire city of Atlanta, putting their arms around these kids and say, we care about you, there's hope for you, you have a future, and we're going to work together for your benefit, not for the benefit of the school system or the, the city council or whoever, we're going to work together together just like we need to do on this crime issue to help these kids have a, a real future. So what is the role, you, you strike me a bit of as a small government person, what is the role of local government in supporting families? I, I think it's a variety of things, but my end state for anything that the government does is that the person or the family becomes self-sufficient. Right. If you want to build intergenerational wealth and your biggest expense for the vast majority of us is shelter, is housing. Why are you paying that to somebody else to build their wealth? Why are you not putting that into your own property so that you have that investment? You have some place to retire to. You you have something to pass on to the next generation. If you're living in a Section 8 house or a government you know, quote unquote, affordable house that doesn't belong to you, you're never going to get to that next step. So rather than yeah, building, but how do they, if they are, if that's where they are today, right. they may not know how to get to the next step. And that's where it goes back to my idea that we take these mothers, like one of the mothers that last night, she said, I'm 40 some odd years old. I had children, my first child when I was 18, I didn't graduate from high school. And she went through the whole litany. And she's like, I didn't know anything about how to get a credit card. I didn't know what credit was. Those are the programs that we need. We need to we need to do that one individual at a time, just like they do at the Drake House, and say, okay, you have a problem reading, we're gonna teach you to read, and we're gonna we're not just gonna pay you to be at home. We're gonna pay you to go to school. When your kids in school, you go to school. And we're gonna teach you financial literacy. We're gonna teach you about your credit report. We're gonna teach you, you know, they do that at the Drake House. They're very successful at it. It baffles me that we cannot duplicate that here, but we're too busy trying to put our I say we collectively, to put our name on some other shiny program rather than say, you know what, they have a program that works. Let's duplicate that. Let's bring them down here to train other people to do what they're doing. Let's duplicate what the, duplicate what the, the prison doctor's doing. I don't need to put my name on that. I just want, only thing I yeah, care you about. Gotta fund, I mean, how are you funding it? Right. So, for example, the Drake House, they had to buy their own apartments. They had to uh, fund everything, right? 
So why, if the city of Atlanta wants to build affordable housing, build affordable housing for a Drake house where those they they can bring in more families. And they have a, a true wraparound services. They have the Lions Club in. They have the 100 black men come in. They have everybody come in there and talk to those kids, mentor those kids, uh, educate those kids, right? And after two years, you know, I went to their uh, 15th year anniversary a couple months ago, and I was in tears because they were – There was a mother who lost her kids to, to um, cancer. And they took care of that mom. They helped bury her child. And now she has her own nonprofit that she helps mothers that are in her situation. But she got there through the Drake House because people cared about her and her child. They weren't worried about their name being on some freaking bill in City Hall, right? And that's what we need to do here in Atlanta. Sorry. No, that's all right. Um. Hmm. So you've got a city council that's going to be almost close to brand new. Uh, when you, if you are indeed elected, we'll have a new council president. There are a number of council seats where there will be um, the incumbent might lose or it's an open seat. And so uh, it'll be a new person in office. If you are indeed council president, how do you, corral the troops so to speak and get people to buy into your vision given that you don't necessarily have a blueprint right you weren't on you haven't had a legislative role before Uh, you certainly had leadership roles but haven't had a legislative role so how do you get people to buy into your vision sorry about that um so i've done negotiations and again you can see this on my website from the tribal level i'm in tribal garb and to you know international level uh, in situations where I didn't even speak the language. And so it takes some finesse. It takes a lot of listening. And you have to see things through the other person's lens. You know, you know, uh, I like to tell my kids and other people, you cannot say what somebody thinks or believes or the way they do things is wrong because you have to understand why it's different. And wrong and different are not synonymous terms. So while we may look at something differently, it doesn't mean that either one of us is wrong. And when you negotiate, you have to come in with that perspective. Why does this person feel this way? You know, and there's always reasons why. And you bring people together on, to, to achieve a common goal. And so what I intend to do is I intend to have at least two pieces of legislation ready on day one for others to sponsor uh, to, to deal with the crime issue. And, and what would those be? Just I, give an overview of what that might look like. I want to deal with the... Um, venues the troublesome venues that have been cited over and over again and remain open that's an easy fix but you have to have political courage to do that and i want to make it a serious offense when you break into somebody's car because there are two things that happen when people break into cars we're going to have over ten thousand car break-ins already this year in atlanta but these kids are going in those cars and they're shopping for guns right that's why we have over a thousand stolen weapons on the street and that's leading to a lot of the gun violence that's on our streets The other thing that I would like to do that is beyond the city of Atlanta, because I think there's a conflict with the Georgia and the U.S. Constitution, but I think there's a way to fix this, is that if you enter inside, and I would like for this to be for all of the metroplex, all the metro area, is that if you leave a weapon in your car, it has to be in a secondary lockbox, right? That would cut down on a lot of the gun violence because the people who are using guns in our city they're all almost a hundred percent are stolen. And that requires, so that would require state legislation. That would require the city standing up and and working with the state. Again, we don't have to have a a cat fight, but we need to make our voice heard. And we need to do this in conjunction with the County because you you think that's even likely given that 2022 is a hot election year and there's so much partisan politics going on in 2022. Um, it's not going to be easy, but I think there's a lot of people on both sides of the aisle who are tired of this violence. And it's just, to me, it's just common sense. that Common the, sense is not common in politics. I understand that. But the thing is, there should be more than a thin pane of glass between a 12-year-old and a loaded pistol, right? And I think a lot of people on both sides of the aisle understand that. And I think that's why, as a, 
you know, I consider myself more a public servant than a politician, that you just have to stand up and fight for stuff that you believe in, whether it's popular or not, because it's the right thing to do. And I'm not, you know, if I'm lucky enough, blessed enough to be elected, I'm worried about what I do in office, not about getting elected the second time. And if, if I could do those things in one term and I and people don't, you know, vote for me a second time, I'm good with that. Got it. Um, there was something he said, and then I lost track when that dude did what, what yeah. did that. <laughs> but but back to the negotiating thing. So there are going to be at least five new council members. I think if we come in there as a team, oh, that we sorry. can. Uh, Hold on, yeah. that's Jay. Open the door. Open open the door so he can say hi, because he's gonna. Oh, all right. That's the guy who runs the place. Okay. I'm like, no, no, I quit in the podcast studio. Come on, man. Oh, is this live? No, 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 no. Uh, no. no I would have had a poker face. I wouldn't yeah. have. I would have ignored it. So cut out the crying part. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> or at so, least cut out part of it. So, Mike, why do you think there's so much crime going on in the city? Or is there? Is it that there's a perception that there's a lot of crime going on, and it's really not as high as folks might actually think it is? Like, what's your a former police officer, enlighten us. So the violent crime is out of control. Um, as you know, we're ahead of last year's pace in murders, and that was a 40-year high last year. I think it's a combination of things. Um, some of this has been bubbling beneath the surface for a while. Um, and by a while, how long is a while, would you say? It was happening before Mayor Bottoms became mayor, right? And I think because of covid and a lot of other things, it just and the George Floyd thing, it was just a perfect storm that all this thing just erupted like a volcano. And I will be the first one to say that I think the mayor has made some mistakes, but everything that went wrong in the city is not on her, is not her fault, right? I think um, part of the problem was when, when the violence started last year, she should have taken a firmer stance, like for example, they did in Detroit, where they didn't suffer the type of mayhem that we did and if you look across the cities that were firmer the violence the deaths and all that were less than they were here in atlanta in places you mean during the protest or just general crime well during the protest and so since that time but didn't she go on camera and had killer mike and whoever else and said you know go home this isn't our this isn't what we do in atlanta but it was too late it was um, like the second day, I th think. No, it was too late. And she and when she threw those police officers under the bus, so they call it the Ferguson effect because that happened in Ferguson. Uh, so what happens is the cops pull back. They're not proactive. And they do their job. They just do what's required. They don't do anything extra. They don't go looking uh, proactively like a normal cop would. And so that uh, the bad guys know that. And then when you have certain restrictions, like you cannot chase somebody, um, that just makes it worse. And then when you make an announcement that you're not going to prosecute certain crimes, if you, I don't care who you are, whether you're sheriff, DA, mayor, if you are in a position of authority and you say we're not going to prosecute something, you just made that activity legal. Because so people, me... I mean, so people are going to engage in that because they know they're going to get away with it. And that just starts to spiral out of control. So there were some mistakes made when she, and those things just added up to now this has become a, a, a city where crime is out of control. So let me ask you this. As a female who lives in an area of town where there has been a lot of crime, I have an expectation that no matter where the crime stats are, very low, very high, that the police are going to do their job, right? right? And I think oftentimes people see police like the military. You might not like who's in leadership, but you do what you're supposed to do because you're sworn to an oath. Right. How is it, uh, your, I, I think your perspective is interesting on this because you are a former police officer. Why does a blue flu happen? How is that okay? I've never participated in anything like that. Um, mostly because I was always in a leadership position, but um, it's a form of protest because they don't have, as a cop, you, you know, you don't have a lot of forms of protest. And it's like a wake-up call, hey, we're not going to put up with this. And then when uh, officers are not proactive, 
Um, they will do what they're supposed to. They get a call, they will respond. But they're not going to go. I'll give you a prime example. A friend of mine um, who's also gay, uh, his husband was at, uh, I probably shouldn't name the business. He, he was at a grocery a store. Location. A yeah. location. <laughs> in a parking garage. And he saw a drug deal going down. He's like, you know, the cops just drove by. Why don't they come in here? And he explained to him, he said, well, that's being proactive. He doesn't have to come in here. He probably knows where the drug deals go down, right? But in his mind, if he goes in there and he tries to apprehend the drug dealer and it turns bad and he ends up shooting the guy, then he stands a chance that the mayor is going to throw him under the bus. His family is going to be without income, food, shelter. So why take the chance? If he gets a phone call and says, go to that uh, location, there's a drug deal, he'll go. But he's not going to be proactively looking for crime to stomp it out because... Why not just quit? A lot have. And, and, and when I ask cops, you know, why did you stay? Their thing is, well, we're waiting to see what happens in the next election. Um, or I'm close to my pension or I've already applied to another police force, I'm waiting, or, you know, or my kids in school. You know, there's all these other reasons why they haven't quit. But most of them, they, they're like, I love this city, and I'm just going to try to um, wait it out to see if things get better. And some do and some don't. So as council president, you don't get to pick who the next police chief is, assuming there will be a new police chief uh, when a new mayor is elected. What are you looking for in a police chief? Well, I get asked this question a lot in forums when they talk about appointing people, and it's I use the same criteria forever. Character and merit. Do they have the character, as Dr. King said, the content of the character? Are they honest? Are they decent? Are they, in, do, are they a person of integrity? Um, are they fair-minded? And then do they have the skill sets, the merit part, to do the job? Are they capable of doing the job? And, and those two, th- you know, you could hold, list a whole laundry list of qualifications, but it boils down to me to those two things, the character and the merit. And it's up to the mayor to pick that person city council has to approve. And I would be looking for somebody who has both the character and the merit to come into Atlanta and to get our police department headed back in the right direction. Does it matter if that police uh, chief is black? No. Um, you know, we had a very good police chief, uh, and police uh, and Chief Shields, who Erica was Shields. Erica Shields, who was white. She also happened to be uh, in the LGBT community. Uh, her partner was black female. That didn't matter to me. The thing was, she was a good police chief, right? And you know, I think it's like sixty or sixty-five percent of our cops in the city are black. Almost all of the deputy chiefs are black. Um, I don't have a problem. I don't care what race, creed, or color the person is. I just want them to have the right skill set and have the right character to come in here and serve our community. How would you rate the current council president? Um, you've talked a lot about council should have, should have done this. Council should not have done that. How would you rate Felicia Moore as council president? I think she's a good, honest, decent person that um, I don't know her personally. I've only spoken to her once when I called her out of courtesy to let her know that I was going to be running for her old seat. I just thought that was the right thing to do. And we had a short but cordial conversation. So I can't talk from firsthand knowledge. I can only talk from watching her in action on the city council. I think she's very fair-minded. We have different personalities. I'm a little bit more aggressive than she is. And so she ran the city council the way that she thought was best. And I will be a little bit different. Um, As you know, I'm by my dress, I'm pretty casual. I'm much more at home in a T-shirt than a tie. And I'm the type of person that will be all over the city. Um, I've run police stations. I've run fire stations. And I will be in the police and fire stations, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning. I want to see what happens when everybody else is at home. I want to be out on the street in a, in a police car to see what happens on a Friday and Saturday night. Um, because that's just my background. That's just the person I am. So that's probably a little bit different than what uh, how Felicia Moore did it. Because I want to see these things firsthand. You know, one of my opponents always talks about statistics and charts and data. Well, data doesn't get it done. There's a place for data, but data doesn't get it done. Leadership gets it done, and you have to be hands-on. And just like when I was a 
equivalent to a police chief. When I talk to cops here, I learn so much more talking to them face to face. I'll give you a prime example. Our city is famous for not paying its bills, or infamous, I should say. So I bumped into a, a police captain, and we start talking cop stuff, you know. And then after a while, it's like, so man, how's it like uh, running your station? He's like, yeah, you know, um, right now we have to wash our own cars. It's like, what? You know, that'll never be on the news. It's like, what do you mean you have to wash your own cars? Yeah, the city didn't pay the car wash place for months. So when one of the patrols went up there with his token to get his car washed, they're like, you can't wash your car until the city pays all their, their bills for the last umpteen months. I was like, that's ridiculous. And, he said, and I said, so what do you do now? I said, oh, well, I tried to use the procurement system to go buy a water hose and a water gun and all the stuff that washed the cars. And that was so complicated and problematic. I just took my credit card, went down to Home Depot and bought the crap myself so my guys can wash their car, right? If you've never been to a police station and you don't talk to cops as people on the street, you will never know that. Same with firemen. I talked to a fireman. He told me that his firehouse had no air conditioning the entire summer. How can you be on the city council and not know that? All, I mean, all 15 of them? I just don't understand that. So my thing is, just like when I was in the Army, I will go on the street with my sleeves rolled up and talk to people, and, and that applies to residents. You know, you know, people used to come up to me and say, you know, the, the traffic light's out or this isn't the right way. And I'd get on my phone and I'd fix it right then. And the city council president can do that. And city council members can do that. And I don't understand, for example, how did they let the, the fire and police training facilities fall apart so they couldn't be occupied anymore? I mean, that didn't happen overnight. And that's not Keisha Bottoms' fault. I that's was interviewing a, a mayor uh, candidate and they said in the 90s, they were looking at doing a police and fire, uh, you know, rehabilitating it or making a new one in the 90s, and it just right. never got done. Right. And so I'm the kind of person, um, I will tell you that in my last job, I used to get in my patrol car and drive around. And the guys that worked for me hated that. And I would find all kinds of stuff. Till finally, they actually took my keys. And they said, you know, sir, by protocol and your rank and all that, you're not supposed to drive yourself in a military vehicle. I have a, dri I have a military driver's license. Like, yeah, but you know. And so they basically didn't want me to drive my car around anymore, my patrol vehicle, because I was always finding stuff. And I'll do the same thing as, you know, as city council president. I will go out and find, talk to people and find the stuff that needs to be fixed. Because, like I said, data has its place, but you don't find everything on a PowerPoint slide. Um, one more question about police. What do you think is most misunderstood about police officers? I think people watch television. They think they know what it's like to be a cop. And um, I always say, you know, that's like me putting a Band-Aid on somebody and calling myself a doctor. It doesn't work like that. Police work is very dangerous. It takes a lot of training. And unfortunately, we don't have that right now in Atlanta. So this is a couple of things that I would push for through the funding side, right? The mayor's going to set the agenda, but we control the budget. And so some of the things that I would push for in the budgeting is more training. What I kind think of the, training? When you say more training, what does that mean? Because everyone says, oh, they need more training, but what And they training? don't know what they're talking about. So, and I'm not trying to be facetious. I mean, but they just, they've never been a cop. They've never been in a uniform. They've probably never been in a patrol vehicle. They don't know what they're talking about. These are just virtue signaling talking points. So one of the things that I find is a big problem in the city right now, uh, what they call in-service uh, training. Um, once you graduate the academy and you're on the street, it's two days a year. That's ridiculous. I think our cops need at least 12 days a year of in-service training. Uh, unarmed self-defense training. You know, there's debate on which method is the best. Pick one. And I think our cops need to have that training. And then they need to have, in addition to those 12 days a year, they need to have an additional day per month where they do unarmed self-defense training. Because my experience has shown me that if a cop is, and I think they ought to have physical fitness standards, which they don't now, that if a cop is physically fit, they are confident, they have the ability to disarm somebody and to control them without reaching for their weapon, the chances of that escalating to a deadly force situation are diminished. I will say watching, whose, his name escapes me, but the Wendy shooting. Right. Watching the guy tussle with the two officers. Two officers, I was right. like, how did he, like, how did they have that much trouble? 
Rashard, Rashard Brooks. Brooks because they weren't trained. And that's not the officer's fault. That's the system's fault, right? So I think and we need to have more unarmed self-defense training. And I caution people, that's not a magic solution because every situation is different. But that's just one more tool in the box that an officer can use. In the Rayshard Brooks example, if those officers had been trained in how to subdue someone without going to deadly force, I think we would have been in a much different place in our city today, right? So when I talk about training, I'm talking about things that I've actually done, right? Community policing. Uh, and my, you know, once I got to a rank where I could have a real influence, I went to my boss and said, hey, sir, I want to do community policing. And he was like, you got to be crazy. You already this spend- is as an MP? As an MP. He's like, you've got to be crazy. You spend much more money than most departments, like the police. Your cars cost the most. Yes, sir, they're used 24-7, right? So I went to his office, and I explained to him what community policing was because he didn't know what that meant. And I told him I need, you know, twenty thousand dollars or somewhere in that ballpark for bicycles, helmets, new uniforms. And at first he's like, not gonna happen. But I I explained it to him, and at the end of that conversation, he hit the intercom and he told the RM, the resource manager, hey, I owe Mike Russell 20K, find him 20K in the budget. And this was community military policing for people on who lived on base who was this for we had uh i think at that time 13 different bases some of them were fenced some of them were not so i partnered with my german counterparts and taught them how to do community policing because their community policing concept was like officer friendly that goes around the school that's not community policing it's every cop on the force right so we retrained our cops um they were a little bit resistant and we had a little uh booklet that was made every week that they carried in their cargo pocket and they had to go by the school, the grocery store, the restaurants, the food court, and they had to go in and make contact with people in there, you know, write down who they talked to and they turned it in every week until it became second nature. And then I started getting phone calls and we had this interactive um, uh, customer evaluation system where people would send electronic messages and say, Oh, uh, Officer so-and-so walked my kid home from school today. Or I, oh, uh, they were out playing basketball with the kids today. And it became second nature. And at the end of that first year, one of the principals who didn't want us in her school, one of the elementary schools, hosted a barbecue for all the cops that worked her school that year because community policing works. And the problem that we have right now is our cops are stuck in their vehicles, one, because they're undermanned, but we don't have, and we've never had, as far as I know in this city, true community policing. And that takes a lot of effort on leadership because the first thing is you have to make it sacrosanct that they do not leave their patrol area, that people in that community know who their officers are, right? And they know that they can depend on them. And when they know that person as a person is not just a person in a, in a vehicle behind a windshield, that changes the whole dynamic. And so that's what I did, and that's what we need to do here in Atlanta. That means we probably need more officers, right? In your training, what role does emotional intelligence play? Or, or thinking beyond, okay, this person is a threat to me. That um, One of the things in the Army that the Army uses repeatedly MPs for is interpersonal communication skills because we're one of the few jobs where that's taught and emphasized over and over again is your interpersonal communication skills, how to read body languages. Not you know, coming to the car yelling right. immediately because no. you're already making a situation tense. Right. And uh, the other part of that is is w- and why I'm an advocate for having two officers in a vehicle, which um, doesn't always work but should work a lot better than one officer. It didn't work in training day. Right. It didn't work in training. <laughs> is that... When you see your partner is getting ready to lose it, your partner steps in and pulls them back, right? And one of the things that I did was, as a leader, is I told the supervisors, if Joe, you know, we call all the soldiers Joe, if Joe loses it and there were telltale signs before that happened, you're in trouble, right? It's your responsibility to know your patrolman and what they're going through. If he's going, she going through a divorce or something like that, you might want to pull them off the street and put them behind the desk for a little while, you know? 
And it takes that kind of leadership all the way down the chain to make sure, because these are human beings. And the other thing that people don't realize, being a cop is very traumatic. Go to a couple of car accidents, right? And it's like a war zone. And we need to we need to acknowledge that, and we need to have training for that. And there are places in Georgia that are starting to do that. This takes a holistic system to make a good cop. It's not, as one of my opponents says, a college education. You could be a great cop and just graduate high school. It takes the right mentality, it takes the right character, and it takes the right constant training to keep a cop being a good cop. Because, and I'll say this, policing evolves, right? And... If you're a good police station, you evolve with the time so that your policing, you know, it's just like technology. It changes, and you've got to stay up with the times. And, and those are things that I think I bring to the table, having been in this business for almost 30 years, to when we, we budget and we fund stuff, to talk to the other members of the council and say, this is why we need to not just throw money at the police department, but we need to target it for certain things so that the money is spent wisely. That's great. I think that's a, a great way to wrap up uh, the conversation. You've given us a lot of your time. Uh, just in closing, you know, the election is in less than a month. Early voting is about to start. Uh, what is it that people should walk into the voting booth thinking about in this election? Who's the person that has the experience in the areas that matter that can make Atlanta safer and better for all of us? And I believe that I have those skill sets. I've done policing. I've done community policing. None of the other candidates have. I've done city services. I didn't mention this during the interview. My last installation, we were chosen as the very best in the Army worldwide for the city services that we provided to our residents. And I've done budgeting for many a year. I know how to do those things. I know how to bring people to the table. And I honestly believe, if I didn't, I wouldn't be in this race, that I have those skills more than any other candidate for this office. Thank you, Mike Russell. Thank you. My name is Mike Russell, and I'm running to be your next city council president. You know, Atlanta, our beloved city, is the home, the cradle of the nonviolent civil rights movement, and we're not living up to that standard right now, and I want to change that, starting with public safety. Public safety is the first responsibility of government, and we're failing at that right now in this city. And I've done public safety before, where others just talk about it, I've done it. I've also done uh, city management. I know how to fix our infrastructure. And I've also done budgeting, and I will make sure that your tax dollars are spent wisely. I'm asking you to give me your support and your vote so that together we can make this city the cradle of the nonviolent civil rights movement safer and better for everybody.